Yeah, so thank you for the invitation and uh, I'll be giving three lectures and I've divided into two parts. The first part is on um, porous media, flow in porous media. Um, that of course is part of the mechanics of porous media, it's the hydromechanics of porous media. And um, I could, of course, have widened it out to speak about also when everything moves in the porous medium, also the matrix, also the, the solid parts, but that would just take us far too far. This is more than enough material. And then I'm going to a part two, and that is uh, the fiber bundle model, which is, in some sense, a model that can be used in connection with the mechanics, I mean the real mechanics, the, the elasticity of, of uh, porous media. And what I'll do there is follow up basically on some of the stuff that uh, Bikas is telling you. He's now giving the uh, in last hour here. Uh, the basics and of, of the fiber bundle model, right? And I'll come in with some field theory, some realization group, and it's a surprise, a paradox. All right, but anyway, so let me now speak about porous media. Okay, so first of all, um, you know, one thinks of porous media as being the realm of the oil industry. But porous media is much, much wider than that. And I'll just remind you of, of 2013, the UN Year of Water, where they put up this poster here, for example. By 2025, 1.8 billion people will be living in countries or regions with absolute water scarcity. And two thirds of the world population could be under stress conditions. Which means the problem of water is actually quite severe. And uh, this is a friend of mine who runs a company who finds water in Africa. And so he drives around with his UN trucks and, and they drill where it's necessary. And this is what happens when they hit. You have a gusher like this. But of course, if you now go back to the 1920s, for example, in Texas, you have exactly the same thing. And what I want to say with this is that this problem of water Water transport and oil transport is essentially the same problem. And what he says, Fritjof Fruden, uh, who runs his company, is that water exploration is the poor cousin of the oil industry. So what is happening now is that the oil industry is riding off into the sunset. Uh, we are reaching the end there. And there are these new um, fields taking over, which are much more important, actually. All right, um, <coughs> so um, let me see if I can get um, this thing to react. Yes, all right, so a little bit status of theory. Now when we have solids, you know, just, just a clunk of, of solid like this one here. That theory is old, that's a couple of hundred years old, the theory of elasticity. Um, before the theory of elasticity, the field of elasticity was a collection of observations and of, of um, um, experiments and explanations of those particular experiments. But one found then a unifying theory I should swallow this, huh? <laughs> I'll keep it, I'll hold it like this, right? Okay. Um, um, all right, so at that point you had a unified theory and then all these experiments will be bound together and you ended up with all of these observations, etc., being reduced to solving differential equations with the right boundary conditions. And that was the goal, then one reached the, the goal of that theory. One has the same in hydrodynamics, in fluids. Uh, before Navier and Stokes and these people, uh, fluids, 
the science of fluids were just a bunch of observations and one had explanation, trial explanations for each of these observations, but there were nothing that bound them together. And then hydrodynamics and Navier-Stokes equations showed up, and suddenly the problem was reduced to differential equations with the proper boundary conditions. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, I'll try to scream, but I'll forget it after a while. But anyway, uh, so what is the status of granular media, porous media? And remember now, granular media and porous media are very much the same thing. A granular medium is something where you have clunks of matter which is not glued together. They can move. That's a granular medium. And you can have an interstitial liquid fluid gas between these grains. If you stiffen up, the, the solid part, you have a porous medium. So you can go all the way from granular media to porous media. And what one lacks even today is a unified theory for, for these. There are no equations. One has not been able to reduce the problem from a set of observations with explanations added to each observation into a unified theory that reduces all these things to aspects of one clunk of theory. I mean, probably it's, it is because one cannot formulate this as a differential equation. That's probably completely impossible. And we haven't gotten to that point where one has found really what they can be ex exchanged for. We'll see. And this is just as an example of, of how complex this problem is. This is experiments done in Oslo and in Australia by, by Sandnes, Knut Molloy and others. And these are just two glass plates, parallel glass plates. In between you have water and you have um, glass beads, tiny glass beads, 100 micron glass beads. They are not glued or anything, they are just sitting there. And then you have here, here are the walls, nothing can escape here, but things can escape up here. And then you start just blowing into this thing, and you get these kind of amazing patterns here. And then you say, okay, so interesting, but you can actually get a lot of them. I mean, look at these amazing structures. These are all made with the same machine, but just running with different speeds and, and so forth. So you have this enormously complicated thing. And we are just at the beginning of trying to understand these things. These, they call them frictional fluids, these. So that's just water with, with glass beads in them. That's all. That's all. And the point now is, how on earth would you find something that can describe all of these things in one, one go? And then you have all the rest. So it is difficult, right? But anyway, for this talk here, I'll, I'll limit myself. I'll limit myself to the case where the matrix, the solid part of this story, is fixed. That doesn't move at all. All I'm going to look at is the flow of liquid between these grains. That's flow in porous media. Hmm? In the experiments that you were showing, hmm? the experiments that you showing, the beads are moving or they are fixed? The beads are not fixed, the beads are moving. This is just, you know, they, these are comes, it's, it's just a slurry, right? You take lots and lots of beads and, and you, you pour them and, and mix, get them into this thing, and then blow into it and see what happens. And, and these beads then move and they, they, start, they start blocking each other and, and you get these, these structures here. For example, here, here you essentially have um, hydraulic fracturing in this end here. Here you have um, basically uh, the beads are not moving and you are getting uh, here uh, viscous fingering. This is an example of viscous fingering. But then you have all these other almost organic forms. All right. But that's not what I want to talk about. 
I'm going to talk about the case where these lab speeds are completely stuck. And the way they do this in their laboratory, and this is again back to Knut Moller's lab in Oslo. So what they have is they have a glass plate and a glass plate. And that glass plate is about this big. So it's square like this, this big. And you put one on top of the other like this. So in between here, you'll see that there is a space. I can see it at least. This is the space where things will flow. So what I've done is here they use contact paper. That's called contact paper. That is uh, a transparent plastic with glue on both sides. So they, they place it here and here. So they take it on one side, it's, this thing is open. And then they have a bucket of these glass beads. They take the bucket, woof, like this, and then they use a ruler like this to get one layer, right? And then they put the other glass plate in place. And here you can see, okay, plexiglass, glass plate, plexiglass, plexiglass. They use plexiglass, that, that's a kind of plastic and it's just, that's an experimental thing. But then also have a pressure cushion here because at the pressures where they are going to flo flood this thing, even if it is like this thick, it will bend a little bit. So they compensate that bending by having this pressure cushion. And this is called a Hellershaw cell. And here they have a camera. Here they have a light box, and that light box, that's about a series of, of light tubes. Uh, with a um, white glass plate that diffuses the light so that the light becomes as uniform as possible. And then, as I said, they have the camera and they, they click, 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 click. Let's see what happens. Uh, here is an example. I'll show further in a moment. Um, okay, so they filled it here with a mixture of water and glycerol. And the reason why they're using water and glycerol, glycerol is that they can fine tune the, in map the index of refraction in such a way that it is identical to the one of the glass. And then the glass becomes invisible. You can't see it, it's like it's empty. And then you simply start pushing in a liquid. In this case, the liquid is air. And it will produce these kind of shapes. And this kind of work was done in 1980s, that's when it started. And of course people um, loved it because that was uh, coincidental with the fractals when they came. So these are wonderful examples of fractals and I've studied a lot, a lot, a lot. Let me just show you if I'm able here to... This is not quite index matched here, but here you can see the, um, how the the air goes into the system. And I can show you the other one. Actually, they're sucking out the liquid here, and it's open here, so air is coming in from this side here. And you can see this one finished a lot before that. That's because this was a lot faster. They sucked much harder. And you can see that there's a difference between this shape and this shape. This is much more pointy, much sharper. And if you had sucked even harder, you would have gotten things which were more, even more stringy. And one of these uh, structures I showed you on this first slides were an extreme version of this one. But once again, just to remind you, the beads here are completely stuck. They're glued in place. They don't move. All that is moving here is a liquid in between. And these are transients. You start with a system in one state and you end up with a system in another state. There's a before and an after. That's very important. But anyway, the fluid could not be pushed because there was a finger. I mean, uh, there's a finger. The yeah. 
Yes, I mean, you would not, this, this, and this, of course, demonstrates one of the fundamental problems in, in, in um, what's called secondary oil recovery. So if you want to get the oil out after it, all the overpressure has gone, you tr do this by pumping in water on the other side, and you get these fingers, and of course you get nothing out almost. You lose everything. The typically uh, 40 to 60 percent of the oil is left in the reservoir when it's declared empty because of these these effects. In this kind of of, um, of experiments. There are two um, non-dimensional numbers that control the process. The first one is called the capillary number. And the capillary number is the viscous pressure drop. And that means simply the pressure drop over a pore divided by the capillary forces in that pore. And the capillary forces comes because there uh, are two liquids here that cannot mix and they have a surface tension. And that surface tension produces a pressure. So you get a competition between this viscosity, the viscous pressure drop, and the capillary pressure drop. The second dimensionless number that control the process is the ratio of viscosities between the two liquids. If you have these two, you ba you're basically able to produce to, to <coughs> to describe the process. And what I'm showing here are three experiments that was done exactly the way I showed. And here you can see the vis I mean the index matching is quite perfect. You don't see the, the beads at all. Here is at the capillary number which is 0 0.029. That means that the viscous forces are quite small. It's viscous forces divided by capillary forces. That means the smaller the capillary number, the more important the viscous for the capillary forces are. Or you can say it this way. The slower things are flowing, the smaller the capillary number. High capillary number, fast flow, slow low capillary number, slow flow. So this is slow. Here, you can see here, it's uh, almost 10 times higher. And you have a much stringier structure. And here is in between. Now, <coughs> this is really like a tree. Because there are two processes here. This you can see in, see in some sense as a stem. The viscous forces produces a tree, the stem of a tree with the branches and so forth. On top of that process, you will have invasion percolation. And that produces the leaves. So what you have here is the underlying branches coming from the viscous process. And that has now been decorated by leaves created by capillarity. This is, uh, this is the idea. I mean, this is the picture one should have in one's head. It is the growth of a, a tree. And if the tree grows slowly, well, you get lots and lots of leaves. And if it grows very quickly, well, you don't have time to produce the leaves. Right. These are transients. Transients means that you start with a system in one state, and you end up with a system in a different state. Now, <clears throat> if you go back into the history of science, um, In all cases I can think of, steady state phenomena where you can forget about time are easier than processes that are transients where time plays an important role. Think of thermodynamics. You know, we've had equilibrium thermodynamics for 200 years now, starting with Sadi Kano and the others. But non-equilibrium thermodynamics is still being developed. 
and there are schools, different schools, and they are not really, uh, well, not, do not always agree with each other and so forth. And that is still active because transients are much dif more difficult than equilibrium steady state processes. And this is a transient. And it's absolutely amazing. If you go now into the literature on, in the physics literature, on flow and porous media, you'll find that there's one group, the group of Payatakis in, in Greece, who have been looking at steady state processes. So I think this is an example of uh, science putting the cart before the horse <laughs> in doing things in the wrong order. They should have started with a much simpler problem. So we have, have since a few years now, uh, taken up uh, these steady state processes. And, and that's a completely virtual field because we are, we are alone at the moment. We are collaborating with a Greek group now, so which means that we are not competing. We are, but, but nobody else is really taking up this. Which is amazing because <laughs> there are so many phenomena. It's a much, much easier than the other one, the transients. Okay, so how would you do steady state in a lab? And I'm, I'm back to Knut Moller's lab, and let me explain the, the machinery they use so that you, you get a physical picture of this. All right, so here is again this Heller Shaw cell. These are the two glass plates. And these two glass plates have been produced exactly as before. So they have um, these glass beads glued in place. And here they put a series of syringes. And they contain uh, non-wetting, uh, wetting, non-wetting, wetting, non-wetting, non wetting fluids like this. And we inject here. And you sort of push them all at the same level like this. So they all go in here. And that creates now a zone where you get mixing. And inside here, around here, you will have a picture like this. Now this is artificially colored. But these are the clusters you see of different liquids. And they're colored in such a way that you should recognize each cluster. A cluster here means that you can walk along inside it, never crossing a border to another liquid. That defines a, a cluster. And what you'll see is, this is a snapshot. If I made this snapshot a little bit later, you would see in a different picture, which means that things are alive. They move. But the averages here, the average density of one liquid and average density on the other liquid here, I mean how much you have one and how much you have of the other one, does not change in time. It fluctuates, but fluctuates around well-defined averages. This is now what we call a steady state. Right. Now, <clears throat> If I am to look, I mean, study the steady state, I end up with more parameters that are relevant than the, than the other case. And the reason for that, and in the other case, I mean the, the transient case. And the reason for that is that these parameters are simply not well defined in the other case, in, in the transient case. So we have the capillary number. This is the viscous pressure drop of the capillary pressure drop. The faster it flows, the higher the capillary number. Here's the viscosity ratio between the two liquids. But in addition, you'll have the wetting saturation. That means what percentage of your liquid inside the porous medium is of type wetting. And by wetting, I mean defined according to, all right. So here's the porous medium. Here's the interface, here's one liquid, here's another liquid. This is the wetting angle. This angle is smaller than this angle, so here's the wetting liquid. If it's fully wetting, then it's like this and you'll have a film. I'll come to that. So you have these two saturations, and the sum of these two is of course equal to one. 
And then you have the wetting flow. I mean, how much volume per time of the liquid, the wetting liquid goes into the pores medium. And the same thing here for this non-wetting flow rate. And the sum of these two is the total flow rate. And the fractional flow, which is a non-dimensional number, is the percentage of the total flow, which is wetting. So, in terms of non-dimensional numbers, you have capillary number, viscosity ratio, the saturations, and the fractional flow. These are the non-dimensional numbers that make sense. Yeah. All right. So what I will, so okay. So what I've done so far is to give you <coughs> a sort of pictures in your head, but I have not really told you some you know hard mathematical stuff. You know, comes now. First, I have to start in the 1850s with the Darcy law. This is absolutely fundamental. This is like Ohm's law in in electrical circuits. And what it says is, if you have a porous medium, and you have, a, this is a continuum description of the porous medium. So you have a pressure gradient. Then the average flow rate in the pores, that's called this, no, what's called the superficial velocity, that's the average flow, but weighted by the, uh, the saturation. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, that is proportional. The velocity is simply proportional to the pressure gradient. And here is what's called the mobility. And here is the unappreciated miracle. Look, you have a liquid and you have a porous medium. They have nothing to do with each other, but you them, them, smash them together single liquid here, and you push it through your porous medium. You get a very, very, very complicated flow problem, right? Because a porous medium is a extremely complicated hydrodynamic problem. Now, but the miracle is that, well, miracle, the definition of miracle is a temporary suspension of natural law. So I shouldn't actually use this word. This amazing thing is, that the properties of the porous medium, the permeability, that's independent of the properties of liquid. The viscosity is a property of the liquid, and it's independent of the porous medium. And these two separate. You know, intuitively, one I would thought that these two should be you know, scrambled together in something very, very complicated, but they are not. They sit like this. And that for me is, is just amazing. So this is really the nice thing about... about so, so if uh, some liquid is like, I mean, let's say, like a flow coming to the surface is topic to some liquid, mm -hmm. then coming to the new plane, coming to the new Yes, if we, yes. I'll say something about when you have mixtures of liquids of different uh, viscosities and, and how that, that ends up if you don't have surface tension, which is actually quite complicated. It's not what one thinks, actually. Um, but anyway, um, the superficial velocity, what I mean by that is I, and this, this is actually engineers who think like this. Okay, I have a porous medium. Here's the porous medium, right? This thing here. And I send now a liquid through. The velocity that is of the liquid entering the porous medium, that's called the superficial velocity. So if I want the average velocity inside the porous medium, I take that, multiply it by the area I see here. That gives me the total flow rate into the porous medium. And then I divide by the pore area I see here. That gives me what's called the seepage velocity. And that is sort of for a physicist the, the, the right thing. That's the average velocity in the pores. Anyway. Yes, because this is always smaller than this. Mm. You know, this is total area, and a part of that total area is a pore area. All right, non-Darcy behavior. 
And this was a big surprise. Um, so this is one of Moller's experiments in Oslo. He's, it's done with this machine here, I just showed you. And they measure pressure drop. So they measure the pressure here in, um, at the entrance, and they measure, this is just air pressure. So they measure that difference. And they plot that as a function of the capillary number. Now, <coughs> they use capillary number because they, they like using capillary number. If I had done this experiment, I would have put the flow rate. Because then it's much easier to compare it with Darcy. <coughs> But if I go back from capillary number to flow rate, what they're saying here is that the flow rate is proportional not to the pressure drop, that's Darcy, but the pressure drop squared. And this is not the Mickey Mouse um, power law. You know, very often in science you will see half a decade and people declare this a power law. Jens Feder's rule is minimum three decades. Then you can say that's a power law. This is sort of a little more than halfway. I think it's good. It's good enough for me. This one. So they have this. And, um, and I didn't. Yeah, well, look at the capillary number here. This is. If you remember these structures, um, injection structures, at these capillary numbers, you would see that you have bushy trees, not just branches, which means that you are in a regime here where you have a competition between capillary forces and viscous forces. So this square here comes from that competition. And now we can answer, well, one can ask, is this Two, is that a solid two, or is it an accident? And what I will show you is that it is not an accident when using liquids that do not form films, because this is done with air and um, this water glycerol. But if you use f systems, that produce film flow. That means one liquid is completely wetting and making these films. This start changing. And here we are at a complete loss. We don't understand this. We have no theory for that, other than the theory which I will now present to you is certainly wrong. That's all I know. But it works beautifully, beautifully for this one here. So what I will do now is to derive this square from statistical mechanics. And if you compare it to the page before, I just had delta P here. Now suddenly there's um, a, a threshold pressure here. I have to be above this pressure in order for things to flow. And the reason for that is that the way that Molde set up his experiment, both liquids were short-circuited. I mean, they could pass through without passing interfaces, which means that it takes a zero, I mean, zero plus epsilon pressure difference to get things to flow. But the more general case is that you have interfaces, you always have to pass interfaces which means that there is a minimum threshold pressure that's necessary for things to flow. So this is more general. They accidentally set up an experiment in such a way that this was zero. It does not have to be zero. All right. So, in order to get a handle on this, you have to do two things. You have to, we want to get the average behavior now, the average flow rate. That average flow rate is an average. So you have to average over something. That something we average over is, of course, uh, the different configurations, the way the liquid is organizing itself. And it reorganizes, reorganizes, reorganizes itself all the time. So that is, is a dynamical thing. And then, this is a disordered system. So we have to average over the disorder in the medium itself. 
So there's a quench type of disorder here and there's an anneal type of disorder here. But as you'll see, I mean this is kind of a problem that could make anybody despair, but you, actually this one is handleable. Alright, so in order to do this, the first thing to do is to well make it as simple as possible. <laughs> so let's look at a one-dimensional tube that goes like this. I've just taken a part of it here. And there's a bubble. There's a bubble. Hmm? If you just work out for a given pressure difference here, how this bubble will move, it actually follows a rather simple law. Namely, the flow rate through this tube is this, that comes from um, solving, I mean, this is a posse. Here is the sum of the two uh, surface tensions here. I mean, capillary forces from the surface tension. And the surface tension divided by the radius, that's Young's law, and that's what we're using. So you end up with this expression here. Now, that expression there, I can just translate into the motion of, say, the midpoint of this bubble. Let me go back. Here's an x-axis. Here's the midpoint. This is what I will call xb. Here's the, the flow equation. I just divide out the area. Area squared, pi, r squared, and then I have the motion of that midpoint. So this is, and here I just put in what is the sum of the two capillary forces here. It turns out to be this one. Now, if you have gone through a course on dynamical systems, you will have seen this equation here because this is the overdamped, driven overdamped pendulum. So, that equation is well known. I mean, it's textbook stuff. So what I can do is, and this is straight out of any textbook on dynamical systems. So this would be the average flow rate. And what was a pressure difference across here? The thing was linear in the pressure difference, as now through the averaging of a position of this here, I mean over time, average over, over time, has turned into a square root of pressure squared minus this. And I take the derivative with respect to the pressure difference, and that gives me the mobility of the liquid in that tube. And you can see that this is well, it is nothing but, I mean, it has, it's not linear, it's not constant, as Darcy would say. Not at all. So it's zero if you're below a certain threshold, and it is going like delta p over delta p squared minus this thing here. And if I now draw it, here's the mobility, and it shoots up, shoots up, shoots up, and it has a divergence here. And of course, if I reverse the pressure difference, I have a divergence equal on the other side. And if I now take, integrate this, you get the flow rate. This here looks like this. So it comes in linearly. That's Darcy behavior. But then it keels over. I mean, it drops down here and comes in at infinite angle here. And then, of course, it does the same thing when you reverse the pressure difference. So you see, this would have been Darcy, but it's sort of cut off down here. That comes from the competition between um, the, the capillary forces and the viscous forces in that single tube. Because there's no disorder in the tube. It's just one or many bubbles moving at the same time, that's all. So we have to do one more averaging. And now we have to take into account that we are dealing with a 
network. So we're looking using a regular network. What I'm aiming at now is to make a meal field theory. So here's the regular network. Could have done this also with an irregular network, but some will be stopped here. Each of these links is one of these one-dimensional tubes. Hmm? Now, <clears throat> and now I'm using the Kirkpatrick um, mean field theory that he published in 1973 in a first Reble review of modern physics on percolation theory to demonstrate that there's a percolation threshold, uh, I mean there's a divergence in, not divergence, but well, it's a singularity in the, the conductivity at the percolation threshold. But the theory is actually wonderful and can be used in many, many other cases. And I'm using it here now. All right, so what you do is you take one, here's your lattice, you choose one link in the lattice. And then all the others here. And then I say, OK, what I will do now is I will replace all the other links by effective links, which are all exactly the same, keeping this link as it is. So now this link is now coupled up with all the others. And I've exchanged the real system by a um, another system, but all these other links are the same. Here's the equation you have to solve then. Okay, so here is the mobility of that single link I've chosen. It sits here and it sits here. This is the average link of all the others. The average value. And if I now average also over this link here, in this configuration here, that capacitive shows have to be equal to zero. So that gives me an equation for M. So I solve the equation, and then I have to put in a disorder. I have to put in um, a variance in the mobility for each of them. And then I just simply choose a flat distribution. Oh, that, I mean, why? Well, it was simple. I solve the equation, and this is what I end up with. So this is the solution of this equation here. This one here. So this is the mean field value for the mobility of a single link. And here is very interesting. The mobility here has now suddenly got a term which is proportional to delta p minus a threshold. And now I have a network of all links being equal. And then I can get the total flow rate. And I get that the total flow rate is proportional to delta p minus pc squared. And this is a threshold. If I'm below that, no flow. That's what you see in the experiment. So, before we had, you know, I mean, if I were going like this, that would be Darcy. For a single link, a single one dimensional system, I came in like this. I came in like this. I came in at infinite angle. The disorder here has smeared out this one here and turned that into a spoon. So it comes in quadratically, and that's the quadratic here. The here. So what we have is this. <coughs> that was sort of mean field theory, and uh, it has a certain bow effect because I can show complicated integrals. But you can also sh understand this intuitively. Imagine now that you have flow at a certain, there's a certain pressure difference and you have a certain flow rate. And there are lots and lots of uh, links that are blocked because there are interfaces there. Imagine now I turn up the pressure difference a little bit. 
more links starts moving, I mean more interfaces start moving, and that means the mobility goes up. It goes up linearly. And therefore, if the mobility goes up linearly when the pressure is different, the flow rate goes up like a square. So it is, it is that effect. It is that you open them up more and more and more, then you get it. And actually, this argument is old. That's uh, Stefan Roux. Not in this context, but in the context of, of non-Newtonian liquids, Bingham fluids. But it, 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 it works here also. All right, so that is now the theory side of it. Um, let's try to do numerics around it. And we have a sort of a workhorse program that we've been developing since the mid-90s, actually. Refining, refining, refining. Basically, what you have is a bunch of links. The links look something like this. When you see them from the side, uh, this is now, a, OK. Just think two-dimensional for a moment. Here are the glass beads of Knut Molloy, for example. Hmm? This is regular lattice. In between here, you have these dog bones. That's a link. And you have a, a gray liquid here and a white liquid here. And you basically follow these interfaces. Mm -hmm. That that's and and and, and you just integrate the position of these in, these things in time. I'll get back to this afterwards, uh, demonstrating that a much more, much better way of doing this through Monte Carlo. But um, but this is what what that model says. And here's actually a picture from 1997. <laughs> uh, this is just showing, you know, Kepler number, viscosity ratio here. And with these numbers, you expect exactly here what you see. Here's a viscosity ratio of 100. So this is the liquid that is going in is 100 times less viscous than the one which is sitting there. And you get these completely unstable fingers. Here, you reverse the situation. And you get, extra, you get something that looks like this. This is stable uh, invasion. And here you do it at a much lower capillary number, and this is into the um, invasion percolation limit. So the model contains all of these things. All right, so here is <coughs> what we see from the network model for modeling these experiments of Knut Molloy. Here is the square behavior. Remember, since this is pressure and this is capillary number, you expect one half for the exponent here, not two. Here's Darcy. So you see the crossover from Darcy to this behavior that they see in the experiment. And these are with boundary conditions that you put the system on a, a, a donut. So it goes round and round and round and round, round. That, of course, is perfect for studying steady state. But here are the precise boundary conditions used in the experiment. This is really trying to emulate the experiment completely. And you see you have exactly the same thing. You have a crossover to the Darcy behavior. And then you have this competition region where you have this non-Darcy square root behavior. I'll continue all the 10 minutes. Is that OK? Just to finish for the day? Yeah. OK, so that was two dimensions. Now, last year, we published experiments and, and numerics on three dimensions. And this is seen at all, 2017. This is done with Sarah Codd and Joe Seymour at the University of, um, uh, of, of Montana in Bozeman. They did the experiments. So basically, they have here a tube filled with glass beads. And they have two pumps here. And they mix the liquids, and then they send them in here. And then you simply measure the pressure difference as a function of flow rate. And here is what they found experimentally. Here is the non-Darcy regime. An exponent here is 
corresponds to 2. And here it is a crossover over to the linear Darcy regime. So also in three dimensions, this is fine. And Santana Senior, he's in China now, he has followed up by implementing his model in three dimensions. So here is a reconstructed Berea sandstone. This is a real sample. You reconstructed the poor network here. And then you just make a copy of it inverse, inversely so that you can couple them like this. And then, of course, this is coupled to this one. And then the liquid just going round and round and round. You can look then at steady state. This is steady state here. And this you can do with several different kinds of, of, um, of rocks that have been reconstructed. These you can, these reconstructed systems you can find on Martin J. Blunt's uh, website at the Imperial College in London. He has some publishers you can just get them you know, and take them from there and use them. So we have three different samples here. And we have, <coughs> here are the corresponding plots. So, I mean, these numerical calculations by Santa Nusinia. And you see in all cases, well, here are the exponents. And here are the high capillary. We see the, this crossover to, to the Darcy regime, and here is the non-Darcy regime. We have a square, root, a square. So this seems very. I mean, th this is um, sort of a nice package story, except for. Let me go back here. We don't know this. We don't know whether it should be divided up like this. We only know that there's mobility here that should have uh, a dependence on the saturation somehow. That has not been mapped out. And uh, we are doing that, but that of course is rather complicated because it's a huge parameter space. I mean, each of these calculations actually take a lot of time. All right. So now it sounds like everything is fine, and then what else is there to do? Uh, and, and this is the nice thing about exper you know, collaborating with experimentalists. So Knud Molle is back in the lab, and he decides, OK, the problem is that I'm using air, and I'm using a liquid. And we don't really control the air here, because air is compressible and compressibility might be a problem. You know, you're doing this extremely slowly. When you're looking at these movies, you know, they look like they go fast, but you know, they take a full day. So things are moving very, very slowly. But you have what is called Haynes jumps. Haynes jumps. OK, so you have your interface is stuck. And then suddenly, there's a pop. That means that there's an interface that starts moving. And that moves into a region which is actually very, very, very easy to invade. So you get a big region invaded. And that creates suddenly a very big change in pressure drops and velocity. So things, even though you think things are going very slowly, they are not. Locally, they'll be very fast. There are these bursts, these, these, so. <coughs> So one should worry about uh, compressibility. Compressibility might play a role in these Haynes jumps. Nobody really knows, but, you know. OK, so what is done is to use two liquids that are, have about the same viscosity. He's trying to be as close as possible to one. So he's using rapeseed oil, and he's using his water glycerol mixture. And then he is injecting exactly the same way as before, you know, with all these syringes and, and so forth. And you can sort of see here 
some of these here, these are uh, uh, excerpts. So this is, when he starts the process, you know, you have to go through it in order to end up with steady state. So this is, you know, he just turned on the machine and the liquids are moving in. And this is after another time. And this is after some more time. And this is after some more time. And remember the syringes, they are being squeezed at exactly a well-defined, not non-changing velocity. So there's always a flow in this. And then he sees this. So here's in the middle of this transient. So it takes two pictures with a few seconds apart and to subtract them. And you can see all that is moving inside here is in the front. There's no motion except for a little bit here. There's absolutely no motion inside here. Everything that is happening is happening in the front. Um, here are the, the total number of experiments he did in this connection. So this is the fraction flow of the oil, that is, of the total flow rate here, how much of that flow rate is oil. And it's two-thirds here, it's one-half, it's one-third. And along here, it is increasing capillary number. So let's see, he, uh, how he, actually here he expresses it in terms of flow rate. So this is 0.3 milliliters per milliliter minute, this is 0.6 milliliters per minute, 1.2 milliliter per minute, and 3.6 milliliters per minute. So this flows 10 times faster than this. And this is the total flow rate. And you can see in all cases here, for example, you have this region here, that's where you study steady state. You can sort of see the traces here of also like chimneys. So what does he find when he plots pressure difference versus total flow rate? Now I convinced him to use Q, not delta P, but he still likes to have delta P here because he controls this one. But anyway, so what he sees is this. So this is one third, uh, fraction of flow one third of oil, so that, that, that. And then he has the other one, the one half. It's a little bit noisy. And then comes this one. That one is actually quite nice. So these are all the experiments shown. These are the, all the points that were, you had pictures of. And this is what he finds. He finds that there is a Pablo dependence between the flow rate and delta P. But the exponent is not one half. You know, he, we will have Q as P delta P squared. You get 0.67 and 0.74. What is different here with the other experiment is that in this case here, you clearly have film flow. I mean, uh, that there was only um, activity in the front when it was moving inside there, it points to that. And he has other signals also that there are films. So the difference between this and the other one, where we got this two, no, I mean, clearly two, is that. Why? We don't know. Open question. And films are very typical, so it's necessary to solve this problem. Um, I think I should stop here. This is a very natural place to stop. <laughs>